Hello and welcome to Beercraft, Colorado's craft beer show. We are here live at the Studio Kitchen Colorado home of the Modern Eater Network. Uh, I'm Jeff Tyler, uh, along with your other host, Andrew Moore. Um, Andrew's from Intrepid Sojourner Beer Project. I'm from Spice Trade, and we are hosting a brand new show. This is our second official show um, about the, uh, the people, the history, and the culture of craft beer and the surrounding uh, industry that supports it. Um, <clears throat> we are here today um, joined by a couple great guests. We have Patrick Holmes of Cerebral and Jake Gardner of Westbound and Down. We're going to get to them in a little bit, uh, in, a, in a minute here. And this episode, we're going to be talking about um, kind of the technical aspect of brewing. Um, so brief uh, kind of background, this month's topic is stout. So every episode we do this month is going to be revolving around stout. Um, our first show was on stout history. Really cool show. If you haven't listened to that, check it out. Um, and then uh, today we're going to be talking about technical brewing of stout. We have some awesome stouts in front of us, um, and we're going to be digging through them in, uh, in a minute here. Yeah, absolutely. And we're li like I said, we're live on Facebook. Um, so if you have any questions for us or for our uh, knowledgeable guest brewers, just throw it up there, and we'll keep an eye on it and try to get to it over the course of the show. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, let's get right into it. We have um, a plethora of delicious beer in front of us right now, and I kind of want to dive in and, and start drinking. So I want to bring, uh, bring Jake on uh, from Westbound and Down to, uh, <clears throat> to tell us a little bit about himself and some of the beer that he brought with him. Cool. Uh, like I said on the, rest, or the episode before, um, I am at Westbound and Down Brewing Company. We've been around three years. We're in Idaho Springs, Colorado. Our sour warehouse, which we share with Amalgam Brewing, is uh, on 64th and Beach Street. Uh, but we're only open one day a month, so look for posts on that. Uh, or just knock, but we can't <laughs> pour you beer on those days. We're welcome to hang out. Uh, and, yeah, it used to be at Hogshead Brewery. It was the head brewer there. Uh, it was there around five years and um, was running both for a while. I brought two versions of our Absinthe Stout, which we released recently. It is a kind of English-style Russian Imperial Stout. Um, one of one of the versions that we we made three versions. One of them was with a pound uh, of Madagascar vanilla beans uh, in a single barrel, and the other wow. is a um, is the base beer blend. Um, so we got both those. They're kind cool. of inspired from my uh, hogshead days and kind of a blend of traditional and, and new wave, maybe. Awesome. That all sounds great. Um, maybe we should take a quick step back to kind of baseline stouts in general. So we talked a lot about the last show about um, Guinness, which is the classic example of the dry Irish stout. Um, so before we crack those open, let's crack open this Guinness uh, and get this poured into everyone's glass so we can have something to start off with. This is kind of the OG of the stout world right here. So, Andrew, you want to give a quick background on, on yeah, so Guinness? Yeah, so Guinness. Uh, and I've got some Guinness here already, so we can pass it that way. Awesome. Um, but, yeah, so, so Guinness, as we know it, it gets a brief overview, Guinness. started around 1820, right, when they, dropped the extra, when they dropped the porter designation from the extra scout porter. Uh, it comes about three years after the invention of black patent malt, um, which is a malt... Uh, that allows for a lot of the coffee and chocolate flavors and as well as the color um, that you come to expect with stouts. And it would go from about a 7.5% um, health beer um, from 1820 into the early 1900s when it, would be, when it would become kind of what it is today, and that's the 4.5% um, dry Irish stout um, that it, you can find the world over. Nice. Well, let's drink it and see what it tastes like, huh? Yeah. Cheers, Cheers, guys. To stout. To stouts. So I think, uh, you know, there's a common misconception when it comes to stouts in general that they're going to be big, full-bodied, high-alcohol beers. And sometimes they for sure are. Um, but kind of this originator of the stout style is very much not that way. It's, it comes off as super dry, very drinkable. It's dark in color, but it only has, I think, 125 calories. And when you compare it to, to Bud Light, I think Bud Light only 
it's like a 10 calorie difference or something like that. <clears throat> uh, Bud Light is about 10 calories less than um, Guinness. So it's still a fairly light and easy drinking um, <clears throat> beer, even though it has this kind of dark and somewhat creamy appearance from the nitrogen. Mm. So what flavors pop out to you guys? I think if just kind of without thinking about necessarily the style, what, what flavors kind of pop out in your mind when you first drink this beer? Well, for me, um, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's that, uh, that characteristic Guinness smokiness from roasted barley that has not been malted. Um, mm -hmm. And I, f I find that that is uh, incredibly uh, prominent in Guinness and easy to pick out uh, that tinge of smokiness because you really don't get that in a lot of other dark beers. Um, there's plenty out there that uh, have the same color or, or uh, even much darker than Guinness when you hold it up to the light, but um, doesn't necessarily have that same smokiness because they're using different types of malts. And so um, in this, I think it's that really uh, that clean highlight of what roasted barley, unmalted barley uh, tastes like right. and what to expect from that. Kind of showcasing that as an ingredient in the beer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, a lot of, um, not a lot of sweetness, uh, not yeah. a lot of... Um, uh, background malt character, you know, it's it's very clean, it's very uh, concise and easy drinking. Yeah, it almost, it, it's so dry when it finishes yeah. too. You know, I don't think I've really sat down and th thought about Guinness, thinking yeah, about Guinness say, like, in a long time, yeah. but it's it doesn't so linger dry. on the palate. It doesn't, almost like borderline kind of astringent level of dryness that just kind of hangs out on your tongue. I think too there's a, um, I think maybe some of the, you know, years of cold falling around this beer is from the juxtaposition too of uh, flaked barley, I believe, is also in this recipe, and it's got, I mean, the nitro is adding a, a bit of cheating on that, but it's got this, like, full round mouthfeel, and then it's bone bone dry, a touch of the astringency comes in, and I feel like, as many things in life, when given polarity, it becomes more extreme, so, like, because you get this round mouthfeel, and then the dryness and the astringency, it makes that finish that you described, like, even more potent, yeah. because it's, yeah. like... Has you get the opposite to. feeling right before it, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good, I mean, that's a good baseline for, for, for stouts. Um, you know, I think the, the other styles that we have in front of us are probably going to be a bit different than this. This was going to be the lightest in body, the lowest in alcohol, kind of the most sessionable stout on the table, I think. Um, so, you know, Jake, you just went through the, the beer that you, uh, brought, uh, I'd love to kind of quick intro, Patrick, um, <clears throat> have you tell a little bit about yourselves and uh, about yourself, uh, your brewing history, kind of where you're at, and then a little bit on what you brought, uh, with you. For sure. Yeah. So, um, my, uh, previous career to, um, where I am now was healthcare IT and then, uh, was really interested in beer. And so I, uh, studied, as much as I could learn about it, and that led me to a career in uh, teaching people about off flavors. Um, eventually became the sensory scientist at Avery Brewing Company, and then um, left Avery for a production management job at Cerebral, and I've been there for about the last year. Um, and it's been, you know, really a really fun transition. I'm a beer history nerd myself. Um, I'm uh, a candidate for Master Cicerone this October, so fingers crossed. Yeah, I heard yeah, about that. Awesome. that. Good luck with that's that. Gonna that that's that's going to be great. You're already in uh, advanced Cicerone, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And for those of you who don't know what the Cicerone program is, it's kind of like the sommeliers of the beer world, um, critical evaluation, understanding the history of different beer uh, ingredients. It's, it's, it's a very in-depth process, as I'm sure Patrick could articulate better than I could. Uh, it's intense, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm at Cerebral now, and, um, you know, uh, what drew me to Cerebral was that, uh, you know, they're making really incredible beers, and um, I wanted to be a part of that. And so uh, a couple of beers that I brought today are our barrel-aged uh, coffee stout, which is Forever Awake, which is this guy here. And then um, the other one that we'll be tasting is our uh, Imperial Stout, uh, Here Be Monsters, which we age in uh, bourbon for about 18 months or so before we release it. Nice. And then... Uh, um, no adjuncts or anything else in that. There's no lactose. There's no uh, maltodextrin or anything uh, in that beer. It's just pure, old-school, intense, big, chewy uh, nice. imperial stout. Nice. So. The polar opposite of the Guinness that we just had, yeah. probably, oh, on the yeah. stout spectrum. Absolutely. Nice. Awesome. I'm looking forward to uh, drinking those. And, Andrew, what did you uh, bring with you from Intrepid? Uh, so we brought one of our flagships. It's our Turkish coffee stout. Um, so a lot of our beers are intended to kind of 
they make different places or different cuisines. So Turkish coffee stout um, comes out of my days working. So my previous career, I was a classical archaeologist. So I was working a lot in Turkey. Um, and the, the Turkish coffee and then Arabic coffee there was just uh, just wonderful. So it's a, it's a um, robusta style of coffee. So it's must, much kind of like earthier, muddier, all in a good way um, than the kind of nutty, roasty Arabica coffees. It's like makes about 85% of the coffee that people are used to. And um, then we <coughs> use green cardamom uh, to kind of spice it up. So in the Middle East, they'll, they'll boil it in the, lo- the coffee grounds in the water in a little mm-hmm. copper pot called a chesve. Um, and they'll sometimes throw in some green cardamom pods gotcha. um, for a little bit of spice. And uh, then orange peel. Orange peel, not so much from like a, a flavor perspective, but more kind of like soften it up and round out the palate. Yeah. Uh, again, so Turkish coffee gets really bitter really quickly. Um, so if you're a tourist uh, or a lightweight, they'll often like boil it together with a bunch of sugar. So the sweet orange peel kind of plays that function of the sugar um, so that you're not left with something kind of dry and astringent. Right. Um, so it's one of my Great. favorite beers this time of year. Yeah. Yeah, I love that beer, too. Uh, that's good stuff. Um, cool. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what the beer that I brought from Spice Trade. Let's get a little pre-rinse going with the glasses so we're ready to, to yeah, tap into Jake's beer. So there's plenty of glasses. Yeah, feel free to use the dump buckets there. Yeah. Um, uh, and so the beer that I brought with uh, me today is our Chai Milk Stout. Uh, the Chai Milk Stout is uh, our flagship, one of our flagship beers. We've been brewing it for a long time. Um, <clears throat> kind of classic Milk Stout base, pretty chocolatey. Um, heavy on the on the lactose, but fairly dry finish for being a, a milk stout. Um, <clears throat> then we add a bunch of chai tea spices. So our brewery is attached to the in, Indian restaurant Yak and Yeti. Uh, we serve chai tea there, and this is kind of the, the first beer that was created to kind of tie those two cultures together, the cultures of India and Nepal, to the beer that we were brewing on site. Um, so we add the chai tea spices later in the process in the fermenter, and it really adds a nice, um, the, the chai blend is primarily cardamom, it's a cardamom-heavy uh, chai blend, but it adds a nice kind of menthol, minty finish to the beer, which makes it pretty easy drinking on the finish. It doesn't end with kind of this big, rich sweetness. It has kind of a nice, refreshing finish on it. So Awesome. Sounds good. Cool. Well, Jake, let's, let's dive right into that Westbound and Down beer. Cool. And a bottle opener. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Four brewers. How many bottle openers do we have? Look at that. I took mine out of my pocket. Nice. Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. So uh, yeah. this beer is twelve and a half percent. So Ooh. be warned on your pour size. Yeah. So run that. We've got a series of these coming too. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. So this is the base Absence. beer. Um, just ten months in Breckenridge bourbon barrels. Uh, we released this mid January, about a month ago. Um, fun beer. It's a blend of two different Imperial stouts. Um, we have two different Imperial stouts. One that will come out kind of the other half of the year that the concept that there's a, a younger barrel age component blended with an older, um, and kind of two different beers. This one is, is the roastier more uh the majority of the base here is a a more english traditional stout and then we have another beer that i don't know if this will be its official name but at least on the brew sheets we call big softy that is uh intentionally higher gravity at like 13.8 and is um is what the name kind of describes it's 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 big but it's more pillowy it's not as punchy on the roast and we use that as kind of the blending component to dial back some of the roast on this one. And we imagine, although we haven't blended it yet, that it will play reverse roles in the other. That that this base, what represents the majority of the absence base, will be kind of what brings some punch and roast into Big Softy. So yeah. um, that's kind of the, the base of the beer. Um, it's brewed with Maris Otter. Um, brewed with Maris Otter as well as... Um, we try to keep uh, roasted barley, no black patent. We discussed that a lot in the last show. Uh, flaked barley, flaked oats, flaked wheat, I think, also. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. I get a lot of like brownie batter, yeah, um, kind of action on it. Uh, I think it's pretty sweet, sticky on your tongue, but it's got enough roast to yeah. kind of make make you keep going back to it. Uh, I find it kind of dangerous to drink for that reason. That yeah. It, yeah, it seems a little dangerous. Run me the alcohol again, 16? Uh, 12, uh, 12 and a half. 12 and a half, okay. So 12 and a half, but it, it, it's got a beautifully rich kind of yeah. uh, silky mouthfeel going on, which works really well with that higher alcohol. Like you said, the oats, the flaked, flaked oats, flaked barley, um, Maris Otter adds that kind of like rich English malt character to it. Um, I think that's really nice. Yeah, yeah it's great. I was, like why the like the flaked trifecta? Well, like oats, wheat, barley. Like why not? So, it's, admittedly, I'm blanking on whether the wheat part is true. Yeah. Uh, but it's it, we were going heavy flaked oats, and then the flaked barley was. I think there's less of that, and it was more of just a nod to. Uh, yeah. Old school. Yeah. Back to the Guinness we were discussing earlier. So yeah. I think there is. I mean, I, I'm not going to be able yeah. to rally yeah, yeah, off yeah, the yeah. percentages yeah. right yeah, now, sure, but sure. It, it's it's a lot of flaked oats yeah. and it's a little mm-hmm. bit of flaked barley. The idea that we're just trying to uh, really have that large mid mouth feel, I think that's what contributes the silkiness to it. Um, yeah. We try to, you know, get the beer pretty dark. So there has to be a, a lot of roasted malt that relies on a lot of chocolate and brown malt. Uh, as well as roasted barley, um, and I think that uh, the combination of all those that by making the mid mouth feel large from the the flaked products, I think that allows you to have more roast on your palate without it becoming ever really astringent. It's just roasty. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious, and we do s- similar things with some of our big stouts. Is that kind of like flaked wheat barley, uh, wheat barley oats, and that I agree, it just kind of adds to that complexity of the mouthfeel as well. I mean, it turns down some of that like astringency, the risk of astringency, um, which is like with some dehusked malts also. But yeah, there's just like a richness that like some styles need that this has. Really, it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? You know, I'm cur- I'm always curious when I talk to brewers. <coughs> um, about a beer that they've created. I love talking about kind of the design intent with the beer because I think different brewers have different approaches when it comes to beer. So did you, how do you go about designing a beer? Uh, like this recipe, for example. Do you say, hey, I want to brew a really traditional imperial English stout. And then you start there. You kind of look at the percentages. You look at what you're supposed to be putting in the beer. And you go from there. Or do you take a different a different approach when you're when you're designing something. Yeah, I think that's you know roughly was our jumping off point. We knew this beer was going to be entirely in barrel, um, which and we knew that you know at least from what we've seen on uh, uh, Imperial Stout we released the previous year, Posse Riot, um, that it seems like the trends are moving towards less and less roast in Imperial Stout. Right. Um, so. You know, we knew a lot of roast would fall off in the time and barrel that was right. planned. Um, but we also were, you know, kind of looking at traditional historical recipes, but then figuring out how can we get that much booze and back, still get the super inky dark color we want, um, yep. but keep keep the roasted quality um, limited while still falling in at like a traditional English imperial stout or Russian imperial stout kind of vibe. Uh, like I said, our other Imperial Stout, which will be out in know, maybe six more months, is kind of the opposite of what this beer is. That is embracing being low roasty, more of the pillowy, yeah. you know, big, you know, alcohol speaks a lot of the punch on that at nearly 14% alcohol. So, um, you know, those are the things we were thinking about. We were thinking about keeping IBUs low and then water chemistry uh, in all our dark beers, I think, um, is 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 you know key to to keeping you know what is roasty not astringent um and so um water chemistry both in the mash pre-boil pre-fermentation are all really probably the biggest keys to those days um brewing beers this big which we don't you know is not our necessarily our, our regular go-to um you know i think those are the uh, if there was a focus of what our uh checkpoints are during the brew day that we want to make sure we nail um ph control is it mm. especially yeah. with a darker beer where it's gonna 
<clears throat> have more of a low pH, higher acidic profile from the roasted malt. Are you trying to make sure that that doesn't get out of hand and it doesn't get too acidic from the, the roasted malt? Is that kind of part of the... Yeah, just trying to play buffer capacity on that like all day with brewing salts. Uh, you know, just because, just like, you know, you can get that flavor from low finishing uh, fermentation pH with a lot of roast malts that taste like cheap coffee that's been left on the hot plate too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think... You know, it's really upsetting when there's a beer that you go to a brewery or whatever, you're tasting a beer at a tap room or you know, at a beer bar, and the beer is great till the finish, and then there's this harsh kind of burn your throat feeling at the end. Yeah. So that's kind of one of our main focuses. Um, but yeah, you know, that's the base beer. I also brought the vanilla, same process, uh, put a pound of vanilla beans in it, um, maybe worth a quick taste but yeah. is yeah, roughly the it. exact same process i just described plus a pound of vanilla beans and a bourbon barrel for cool a little over a month yeah you should break end. it out cool yeah that sounds you good still have that same patrick to the rescue nice yeah. our uh, bottle opener to brewer ratio is not very good yeah it's pretty sad yeah So you said you do a little bit of barrel aging. How, what would you say, like how many barrels do you guys have at Westbound and Down? In the clean program, not a lot. We're currently redoing the uh, what we call the knife shop right now because it used to be a knife shop in Idaho Springs that we use for dry storage. You know, we've got, uh, we've got ferrules running through the wall so we can pump beer over there, pump it back. Um, but right now I think we've got, I don't know, 14 barrels full of Imperial Stout and maybe five or six with barley wine in it. We'd like to expand that, but while under construction, the barrels are getting pallet jacked around. Yeah. Um, so currently that's our limitations. Uh, hopefully in three to four months, we're gonna get to go a little more wild in that finished space. Nice, nice. That's exciting, that's fun stuff. Man, you, you pour this beer and it explodes with vanilla. Vanilla is a tough ingredient to get to pop out you know, in an intense way, I think part of it yeah. because of how well, expensive just, vanilla is. How many pounds in one barrel? So it was a pound in a single, uh, you know, 53-gallon or whatever yeah. that is, bourbon barrel. Um, but then that product is blended like the rest with the, the big softy component. And so that's, adds, I don't know, I think that's, if I recall, 15%-ish of the blend. So... So, so this, this blend is 15% of that kind of concentrate, for lack of a better term, the concentrate barrel, 15% of that plus 85% of no, the, opposite. the regular absence? The opposite. It's like 85% of the base of basically this exact liquid for, you know, there was, I don't know, it's hard to describe. I've confused myself. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a barrel of Imperial Stout yeah. the last, at age 10 and a half months, the last five or six weeks, it had a pound of Madagascar vanilla beans, we cut them in half, get their kind of tar innards out of the middle of them, um, and then uh, jam those in the whole pound in, in the barrel. And then we blended it roughly the same, exactly the same way we blend the base with a different imperial stout. So basically 15% more liquid was added to that barrel. Gotcha. I don't know what that mass is, yeah. but I mean, I think mm -hmm. we yielded 75 gallons or something. Nice. So that's this beer. Um, it makes me want like pancakes or waffles or I know you guys have the, the work from home. It's like it's reminiscent of, of, uh, of a good breakfast beer after a tough night, maybe. Yeah, I, don't, I want ice cream. <laughs> ice like cream a, would be good, yeah. Like a Sunday to go with this beer. <laughs> I just want more beer. <laughs> <laughs> I want more beer to go with this beer. Yeah. Nice. Not a problem. I'm going to be hammered by the time we get to the last beer. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll take, we'll take small small bits of, of this beer here. Um, do, you, do you guys think about it? Because Westbound and Down is, is a brew pub, correct? Yes. So, like, does that factor into how you approach making the beers? Or, you know, which beers you're, you know, do you, are you thinking about food when you're thinking about Russian Imperial Stout? Yes and no. I think uh, there's beers in our lineup where we certainly are working. We've got some awesome chefs, um, just hired a really awesome chef. 
um, that we're excited to announce soon, so I won't announce that. But um, we've had Scotty Parker was up there with us a while, who was at table six. We've had some really awesome people up there cooking, and we've certainly utilized their palates in uh, in our kind of our tasting of our analysis of our beer um, and how we move forward with you know furthering recipes that we already think are good and are worth rebrewing, um, as well as you know, we've even designed some beers that are to pair with seasonal items on the menu. Uh, and in other cases, it, you know, sometimes the chefs will come to us and say we're making th this, you know, what pairs with it. But, and, but I'd say more often it goes the other way. We go to them and say, hey, we're, you know, yeah. Yeah. this beer is coming out. Yeah. What dessert item can you have on the menu that bears with it? Or in this case, or, you know, yeah. we've got this super tropical double IPA, like you know, a bur like a burger or anything that you can bring in that could add a tropical yep. fruit kind of component. Uh, we do have pairings with everything that's on our menu, so we're certainly thinking about it. Uh, what direction it goes kind of changes. Depending. Yeah, and it's a little bit easier, I think, to go, this is the beer we're working with. It's, it's, it's quicker to make a food item than it is to make a beer in the grand scheme of things. So it's always a little bit easier to kind of, I think, go from this is the beer we have, how can we kind of develop a recipe item around it? Um, but do, do, do your chefs ever use the beer in the food? Um, that's yes. something I've always been interested in, and I think people love when the beer gets utilized in the food somehow. Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple that are the obvious, the mustard, the beer cheese, um, but we had like a spent grain salad um, last, I guess, like early winter that was really awesome. Um, it sounded weird to me, and I was like, this is, you know... <laughs> There's a reason we're feeding this to cows. <laughs> why you're going to try to put it in our salad? But it uh, was really well executed. So we, we've had a handful of, uh, you know, more interesting um, combinations. Um, right now, I think our Belgian triple is in uh, the new salad as part of the dressing. Mm -hmm. It's like a vinaigrette deal going on with our Belgian uh, triple. Nice. So um, usually there's two to four items on the menu that are incorporating uh, food with the beer or awesome. beer in the food. Yeah. That sounds great. I know you only have a couple more minutes and then you got to run. I have one, one more question for you. We, uh, I'm we at least sticking around for these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm let's running late for <laughs> the real boss, my wife, so I can't be it's so late because gotcha. I'm in big trouble. Yeah. You probably We're celebrating Valentine's Day today, so it's a like can't mess up yeah. scenario. Well, but so we should drink more barely yeah. Yeah. beer. Let's do that. Let's start you a little bit. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do that. So Patrick, if you could maybe give us, us yeah. my car. Patrick, Kick give it off, us man. thirty minutes to kind of lead into this and we'll have Jake hang around. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> that might be a stretch. That's a lot of <laughs> dead time to fill. Yeah. So um, uh, we have a bunch of different stouts that we make currently at Cerebral. Um, and a lot of them are based on sort of different approaches, right? So Here Be Monsters is the most stripped down, uh, not, um, there's not a lot of adjuncts in that beer. Uh, there is a, um, you know, a, a very long boil to tr sort of uh, develop flavors and, and uh, plenty of um, melanoidins to, to add complexity and, and make it interesting. Um, so, uh, sorry, let's um, pour it so we can talk about it. Yeah, let's maybe. drink it. I'm excited. All these talk about melanoidins getting me all excited. <laughs> Toast, melanoidins. <laughs> um, yeah, so for those who don't know, melanoidins are kind of the, the a f common flavor compound that's associated with, like, toasted bread, right? How would you describe it as a Cicerone in the, in the group? Um, you know, so... Uh, you, you can develop a lot of different sort of uh, intensities, right? And so um, uh, you, the, the best example I can give of melanoidin um, is, is incredibly lightly toasted bread, but it has a, it has a range, just like mm -hmm. everything else, right? So an incredibly lightly toasted slice of white bread is going to have a slight you know, toastiness to it, um, whereas you, you, can, you can extend that range all the way down to these deeper, darker, rich, intense flavors. And so... Um, on something like Here Be Monsters, we, um, we do a double mash, which means that we're filling our mash tun twice uh, for a single run of beer. 
And so you do one run through the grain, you dump all the grain, you mash again, you do one run through the grain. And that goes into the same kettle that, that is going to become Here We Monsters. And so um, wow. that allows us to, uh, and when we max out our mash ton and both times. I mean, we're, we're talking um, the maximum amount that we can put in there. And uh, our brew house was actually designed with an, uh, a slightly oversized mash ton as yeah. well. And so um, we max it out as much as we can. And this is actually based on a homebrew recipe that Sean had um, before he started Cerebral Brewing. And, and um, it's, it's worked out incredibly well. And it's, it's certainly uh, evolved a little bit as time has gone on. Um, where, you know, certain things are, are tweaked and certain things are, are changed per iteration. Sure. Um, we have several more that are going to come out uh, in um, 2019, or at least hopefully two that will reach maturation point. Uh, we, we try to age for 17 to 18 months in barrel. Um, interestingly enough, this was um, a Four Roses um, uh, blend, so uh, a, a bunch of different Four Roses barrels. And uh, I find were these, were these first use barrels, or had they been mm -hmm. used before? No, uh, always first use. Always yeah. first use. Yeah. So, and and I I've heard of people using second use just to get um, micro uh, oxidation. So, uh, for people that don't know what micro oxidation is, the reason we barrel age beers is because there's lots of things that goes on there. So, uh, when you put uh, beer into a barrel, uh, there's there's a, a bunch of biological processes that that are happening there. Um, but in addition to that, there's also um, a lot of uh, chemical processes happening there as well. So you have little bits of oxygen that are seeping through the wood into uh, the liquid itself and are oxidizing compounds that are a little bit on the harsher side. So um, Here Be Monsters taste just fine out of the fermenter. Um, and that's something that um, any brewer will tell you, you can't take a bad beer and barrel age it to try to make it good. <laughs> you gotta take a good beer and barrel age yeah, it in order make to make it better. It better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we take a good beer and we make it better. And so um, uh, we rely on oxygen coming through the wood in order to oxidize some of the compounds uh, to form new compounds. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, there's a process in which you lose water because um, ethanol molecules are, are much larger than, than water molecules. And so water will slowly evaporate out, whereas ethanol will, will stay behind for the most part. You do lose some. Um, but uh, the angel share right, yeah, is what uh, they called it traditionally when they didn't know why they had right. less volume in the barrels after a couple of years the what angels happened? were taking it away so um, uh, we do get some ABV pickup that way but for the most part it's, uh, it, it's quite strong going to the barrels um, but this beer is um, built on an 8 hour boil process and so we, we boil it for an extended period of time in order to create uh, plenty of those fun uh, caramel like uh, compounds that, that will make it in the finished product. And uh, you have a direct, direct fired brew house or Correct, steam? Yeah. Direct so fired? It's, it's really hard to do um, any kind of, and, and it's not impossible, but um, it's hard to develop mel melanoidins with a uh, with a steam jacketed kettle or, or with um, an internal calandria. So, so uh, some, some quick kettles will have that internal component that uh, that's how they're heating the wort. Right. Um, but uh, with this beer, we're, we're relying uh, on the fact that we have a, uh, you know, smaller brew house and, and it is just a huge um, natural gas burner underneath it. And mm -hmm. so we're able to get that contact with incredibly hot metal and right. uh, incredibly sugar rich wort in order to, to hopefully make some fun compounds to, yeah. to make it to the finished beer. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the first thing that pops out when you pour this beer is compared to any stout we've had today. It has the darkest, <clears throat> most rich chocolate colored head, just from like a visual perspective, right? You kind of compare this to, I think this is the Guinness, right? Yep. Where it's like this very white, um, white head, and then you have um, the Here Be Monsters, which has this rich chocolate head. <clears throat> and I'm assuming that that's from the, a lot of the melanoidin creation during the, the, the boiling process, the extended boiling process, and then the double mash, um, where you really end up with this very, very, very concentrated wort to start off yeah, the process. Sure. What's, the, what's the starting gravity of this beer? Um, it's quite high. Uh, <laughs> I will say it's over 30 Play-Doh. Um, I, I want to say it's usually 31, 32. Wow. Um, it's, uh, it's intense, and for people that don't know what the Play-Doh scale sort of looks like, um, you know, if you look at a normal IPA, you're about 15 uh, yeah. max. It's and double, if you look at, double, uh, double. <laughs> if about you, double. If you look at like a Pilsner, you're it's at like stout. 12 to it's 12 to 14, maybe. And almost exactly, it's like the the weight of sugar in the liquid. 
So right. like 31 right. Play-Doh roughly right. means the weight of that liquid is represented by 31% sugar. Right, right. It's, a, it's a lot. A, yeah, it's a ratio of sugar to water. So the more sugar, kind of basic brewing science 101, the more sugar you have in your wort, which is unfermented beer, that's what you're making when you're mashing in all your grains and adding all your hops, the more sugar you have, the higher your alcohol could potentially be because you're going to add yeast to it. The yeast, are, they're going to eat the sugar that's in the wort, and they're going to produce alcohol from the sugar they consumed, and then the sugar that's left over is what provides the residual body and sweetness in the, in the final product. And so for a beer like this that has 16, what was the percentage on this? Um, 14 I think this half. batch is, yeah, it's not, it's not horribly high. It's 14.4, 14, I think, is what it came back at. Um, gotcha. And it's anywhere between 11 to 13 going into barrels. Right. Um, and we do pick up 2, 2.5% in the barrel, and that's something right. that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, when you barrel age a beer, you do lose a considerable amount of water. Yeah. Um, and there are instances in which I've, I've heard of people picking up as much as 4% alcohol in, in an oak barrel yeah. after an extended period of time. So Yeah, barrel aging is cool. It's, it's, it's a complex process too, right? You have evaporation happening, so you're concentrating your ethanol. Right. You have potential pickup from the spirit that's left over in the barrel before you even put anything into it. Um, there's a lot going on in barrel aging, and, and <clears throat> I think, you know, kind of... To, to compare this next to Guinness, Guinness has a very dry finish. If Guinness was 14.5% alcohol and it had the body that it had, it would be the worst beer on the planet because it would be right. impossible to drink. So you need... Hot fire. Yeah, it would be hot fire. <laughs> Everyone would be spitting hot fire. <laughs> so you need that sugar to really balance the alcohol in the beer, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, there's plenty of other things going on there, right? So... Um, Hitting the proper carbonation level is incredibly important because if right. you are overcarbed or undercarbed, it's it's going to affect how that beer presents uh, in the, in the long term. And so you want to hit a proper carbonation level. You want to have enough res residual sugar to balance the beer, um, unless you know there's something one way or the other that you're you're going for, right? So if you're if you're trying to make a sweet stout or you're trying to make um, uh, one of the uh, BJCP recognized stouts is tropical stout, and that's one that was essentially adopted by people on islands that wanted to rebrew foreign export stout from someone like Guinness. And so, um, you know, in regard to that, it, it was just naturally incredibly sweet because their yeasts weren't up to the task, and yeah. uh, it ended up being really refreshing for that climate. And so, it really just depends on you know, what exactly you're trying to do and, and, and what exactly the end goal is with that particular beer. And for monsters, it's, it's, it's a monstrous stout. It's, uh, it's big, it's bold, it's, it's sweet, but balanced. It's, yeah. um, it's got a lot going on, but, um, is subtle enough that you can give it to your, your father-in-law and he's fine with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you quiet him down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Out of your advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's an interesting point, too, because there's, there's a lot of, you can sit down, you can look at BJCP styles, and you can be fussy about a beer not meeting the BJCP styles, and you can kind of, you know, frown upon people who aren't meeting standards. But I, I personally think it's nice to look at beer from a flavor perspective Absolutely. versus a, am I meeting this other person's definition of what this needs to be because at the end of the day, I mean, we talked about this a lot in the last hour, history, people who were making Guinness stout weren't like, I need to go reference the Irish dry stout thing to make right. this, like you're creating something organically for some reason, whether it's history or circumstances or available ingredients. And that's, that becomes a cultural thing as a result. And so I like the idea of thinking about what is the design intent with this beer? Um, how do we make that? And how can we, uh, explain that to people because part of it's education, right? You have to let people know what you're going for. I think the design intent behind a beer is more important when you're a craft brewer than if you're a macro brewer who's doing something that's established and people know what to expect and it's pretty straightforward. But if you're, you know, we talked about this a little bit more and I'd love to kind of touch on it again um, about expectations as far as kind of the new school beer drinker versus the old school beer drinker. Right, we talked about this in respect to the, the beer that you brought with you. Some of, you know, some of it had a little bit more roasty character that um, kind of a, a different population seemed to like. Right? Um, yeah, I actually, uh, I had not had this batch of this beer. As I recall having it, um, I don't know, was it a year ago that this was available? Um, we had two releases in two thousand 
17. So, yeah, we, yeah, we, we've had three total now. Cool. Yeah. I'd had one of them. I couldn't speak to which, which this has more, um, I think this beer is excellent. It has a lot of roast character as well. Um, but I do think there is kind of like a new trend, uh, which is opposite of what we talked about in the history where people were trying to like out stout the stout. Where like uh, people now, it's yeah. like, how big can you make it without making it that? Yeah. Or how, how hazy can you make this IPA or yeah. something like that? Yeah, but now it's like an odd trend in stout where you're seeing somewhat in these like pastry stouts, which have been referenced that, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's like instead of the porter to stout arms race where it was like, can you make it bigger and more roasty? It's like, can you make it bigger, but not that roasty mm. and super sweet. And uh, I think the first two beers we've had is, is as more of like you described, it's like an old school um, in your face stout. Um, I think this is quite excellent for that reason. Uh, not that there's not room at the table for all of the above. I think it's just about what your expectations are when you right. approach the beer. Right. If you think you're getting what as a brewer, I would be like stout, stout, you know, right. Um, this fits that bill. Uh, if you think you're getting, um, you know, if, if I think I'm getting that, I'm given pastry stout with, with donuts in it. It's sweet and confusing, but if I know what I'm getting into, maybe it isn't sweet or confusing. Yeah. Um, but that kind of gets into that whole labels deal. If somebody just puts it in front of you and says, is this delicious? It can just be delicious. Yeah, it can be delicious in its own right, or it can be balanced flavor. I, I kind of always default back to, like, is it balanced flavor-wise? But th there's also, like, when are you consuming this beer, right? If it's, like, I'm out at a football game and someone hands me a 15% Imperial Stout, it's, like, wrong stout for the moment, probably. Like, I probably want something a little bit lighter. So there's, I think, I don't know. I think Guinness it's, might win in that Guinness scenario. might win in that scenario because it's an easy drinking beer. And Charlie Bamford says that his favorite beer is the beer that's in front of him at the moment. So yeah. it's one of those things where... Well, uh, we got a lot of good know, favors yeah. right now, I'll tell you that. But, and I think it's about, I mean, it's about, like, setting expectations, right? I mean, I make a few enemies. But, like, beer styles, in my mind, are mostly for communicating expectations to the consumer, Right? Like, I know that I like IPAs. I know that I like dry Irish stouts. Like, that's what I want to get into. And I mm -hmm. feel like it's a little bit different for, like you were saying, with craft beer uh, uh, producers, with brewers at craft breweries, microbreweries. Like, it tends to be more of a, uh, like, did I communicate the intention of this beer the way that I wanted to, right? And the style becomes a lens through which someone can say, oh, I'll, I might like that beer. I might like this beer. Yeah. Well, it's tough, too, and there's just, like, that one moment on the label or, like, you know, there's a flashing screen at your bar. And it's a ton of confusion, too, because if we're, if we're completely honest, uh, the guidelines uh, set forth by BJCP are totally disregarded by most American craft brewers. So if I say, this is stout, and it's 50 to 75 IBUs and... And porter is 25 to 50 and uh, whatever, right? So if I, if I define what porter is and I define what stout is from an American standpoint, it's sort of uh, not what people expect because uh, I think that if most people sat down and they said it, um, and, and I put a flight of beer in front of them and I said, is this each one of these? I want you to tell me if it's a stout or a porter. Very few people would be able to tell you if it's a stout or a porter because very few people drink what is considered a good example of the style. Yeah. And so there's a lot of confusion. And we have plenty of people that come to our tap room. Um, Night Glow is one of our uh, uh, imperial porters that we make. And we make it probably once or twice a year when it's cold outside. And we have plenty of people that come into the tap room and they say, I'd, I'd really like a stout. Do you guys have any, uh, anything on, on tap like that? And, well, we've got this porter. And um, I, th I think it's probably what you're looking for. And they're like, oh, I don't like porters. And it's like, no, nah, just, just you should try this because yeah. I, I think that you would really enjoy it. And I think it, it has what you're looking for as far as what that uh, porter uh, slash stout experience is, right. uh, which you guys touched on in the last episode. But it's, it's just funny to me how that has carried on where, where people are still dividing porter and stout and, and picking a side, so to speak. Yeah. And the history is like which we talked about last episode, is literally as confusing as people showing up to the tap room under your description, which I would agree 100%. with, I've had, still is. I mean, the, the, the history was vague and confusing and happening all at once. And craft beer has further made a mess of that in the fact that, you know, 
people are making beer all over this country in small pockets and it, it isn't like all being communicated to everyone at the same time. Yeah. So when people say like, what is Porter versus Stout? I can tell you some vague definitions that one will have, you know, Porter will have limited, you know, restrained to no use of fully roasted malts, either black patent or uh, roasted barley, but it can have some and whatever some is, is right. vague. Yeah. And then others <laughs> can have, you I know, stout yeah, can have some to a lot. <laughs> so one guy's Imperial Super Porter could be another guy's Imperial Stout and Thousand neither percent. are wrong. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd say the only yeah. thing that might be true if you believe there's meaning in life is that, <laughs> uh, which I'm not even suggesting you should. Uh, or that's, that's next week's topic. Is there meaning in life? Yeah, Should but, you believe there is? Yeah, yeah, yeah but you know, we're gonna drink maybe you at least have polarity yeah. between your porter is less roasting than your stout, and right. then at least you've made some sense of it within the definitions created by your own brewery. But yeah. other than that, I think that you know it remains yeah, it very comes, confusing. It comes down to personal preference too. It's like if I like your porter, I like your porter. If I like your interpretation of a stout, I still like your beer. At the end of the day, it's like I enjoy the product you're making. And honestly, I can, I can think of times a decade ago when I was reading posts on homebrew forums where they're like, well, porter is when you don't use roasted barley, yeah. and stout is when you do use roasted barley, and that's the difference. And it's like, okay, well, but there's plenty of people that still believe that, and there's plenty of people that are still looking for a Guinness taste versus a, uh, a strong brown ale kind of concoction, and... The fact of the matter is, when it comes down to it, most of those comparisons are all based on marketing. And so it's one yeah. of those things where uh, an imperial breakfast stout is probably going to sell better than an imperial breakfast porter. Yeah. Because people just have different connotations already developed in their mind of, I saw my dad drink right. stout when I was growing up. He had Guinness stout. So that's a strong, fun beverage. I've had fun stouts that I've liked. And right. they carry that on. So, well, and it cuts both ways too. Like we we want to create expectations, right? I mean, right? Like flavor and aroma, aroma especially. And we've talked about this, but it's like one of the most suggestible uh, senses. I'm gonna take a quick time out here, Jake. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know you got to run. Uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks for sharing your beer. And yeah, thanks, thanks for, for being part of the show. Thank you very much. And don't get in trouble with your wife. <laughs> Cheers. Best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so part of it, it you know, works for us. I don't want to make it sound, I don't, I don't make styles sound all bad, but like it works for us in the sense that 100%. we can set the expectations that we want and make those suggestions um, because people are going to taste, typically people are going to taste what you tell them they're going to taste. Yeah, it is yeah. a very suggestive, I mean, uh, you've, you've probably experienced this many times in your studies and, and exams for the Cicerone program, but it, it's, aromas are, and, and flavors in general are very, very suggestive. We did um, this great experiment, which I love, which you've probably done before, where you take <clears throat> two beers, um, and one of them's dark, one of them's light, and you ask people to describe some of the flavors. They, they drink one of the light ones. They say, oh, it's, it's light, it's sweet, it's grainy, whatever they say. It's, they drink the dark one, oh, it's chocolatey, it's roasty. And you're like, well, th that one's been tied with cyanar or, or cin cinnamar? Um, cinnamar, yeah. Cinnamar, yeah. and it's the same exact beer, and it's just color different. And your eyes play, play tricks on you. I think there's, my personal opinion is there's a lot of psychology that goes on Totally. Even beyond um, visuals, just how you're feeling that day, the experience that your tap room provides to someone that legitimately changes someone's understanding or perception of yeah. what you're doing. So tell us what we're going to taste in uh, Barrel Age Forever Awake. Yeah. So Forever Awake is our uh, Imperial Oatmeal Stout that's um, <coughs> aged in bourbon barrels, and then we uh, dose uh, coffee from Middle State Roasters, uh, actually down the street on uh, Santa Fe. Um, and so we, um, you know, build that beer to be relatively versatile. Um, we're able to make a couple of different brands off of that particular beer. And based on what the barrel is telling us, we're able to sort of transform that in what we want it to be. So we have uh, Safe Word, which is the same base as well. So Safe Word is, um, you know, it's got coconut, it's got um, uh, coffee and, or um, coconut and, and chocolate and, and vanilla. Mm -hmm. in it as well and so it's one of those things where um, we can build a base and then and modify it as the barrel speaks to us right so if we have a ton of vanilla we might go one direction or the other 
uh, or if it's more roasty, we might go uh, uh, the direction of uh, something like Forever Wake, where we think it's going to play well with coffee, or if it has a dark fruit character, right? So uh, dark fruit, obviously, is going to work really well with any kind of uh, coffee that we throw at it. And so um, this one was a fun one that we could um, throw a bunch of really nice coffee from Middle State at and uh, end up making this really fun uh, rye barrel-aged oatmeal stout that has these fun coffee notes that... Um, sort of envelop the barrel character and you get yeah. you get actual coffee and then you get coffee like character from the malt right. as well as um the uh the barrel character itself of, of vanilla you get some yeah. spice there i think that's a cool approach we we talk about this a lot and i'm a big proponent of layering flavors in beer <clears throat> whether that's adding the same ingredient in multiple stages or adding similar flavor compounds and trying to match that like you're talking about adding coffee to a beer that has coffee like flavor compounds already built into the base beer i think it's a really way to make a very complex well-rounded flavor profile um, and this beer is cool. It's, it's, it's surprisingly different from the one we just had. I think the rye spirit character is a lot more forward in, in this beer yeah. than the bourbon mm. in yeah, the so, previous um, one. Uh, Here We Monsters was uh, exclusively Four Roses uh, for that one. Um, and then this one is um, a blend of, of two different rye producers. Mm. Yeah, but, yeah, it's fun. You know, um, that rye barrel spice, people think that barrel aging as far as uh, any kind of whiskey it's going to be relatively similar, but uh, bourbon uh, compared to rye is going to be pretty radically different. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things where people have to taste both of them side by side to really understand. And, and we have a, um, a port barrel aged stout with, we did with coffee that will be coming out for Valentine's Day, and, mm. and that's radically different. You know, you get yeah. a, a ton of cherry character, you get a ton of um, sort of intense. Uh, dark fruit character as well that sort of plays off of the uh, the bourbon that was uh, held in that port barrel afterwards. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you can do a lot with different different flavored barrels for sure. I kind of want to I want to ask you a question about cerebral. I think you know, I mean, we've tasted some really awesome examples of, of very complex um, beers, both from a flavor perspective and a production perspective. Um, nothing is simple about these beers. But I think if you asked 80% of people in Denver, what kind of beer does Cerebro make? No one would say stout. They would say IPAs. And that's not to say that you're not a well-respected stout brewer. Obviously, you are. You're making amazing stuff. But, but how, does, how does that work? Um, you know, you, you have this style that um, you're kind of considered one of the big players in the, the hazy IPA, if you want to call it New England IPA, your sure. interpretation of that style of beer. Um, I don't know if you know the rough production breakdown of kind of your stout versus your IPA, and I know you're delving into sours, a lot of, of different types of sours as well. Yeah, it's certainly significantly different. Um, I will say that, um, you know, uh, IPAs are what a lot of people have, have built their breweries off of. Um, and Stout is a pet project of ours that we, you know, very much so want to develop um, further. Um, we rent a lot of space um, in uh, Law's uh, Whiskey House barrel aging facility. So we've got uh, 2,500 square feet over there that we're aging a bunch of barrels at. Um, and in that space, uh, probably half of what we have over there is uh, clean beer. So we have a considerable amount of barrel aged Stout that will be coming out. Um, and Porter that will be coming out in the next, um, you know, year uh, or two, yeah. depending on what it is. Um, we're, we're delving into barley wine a little bit there as well. So we, we've got, you know, 80, 90 barrels of um, quote-unquote clean uh, beer that's going to be uh, coming out in the next year or two. And so I would hope that people would um, uh, have the opportunity to taste sort of what we have to offer in the next few years. Um, but it is very much so old school in that we're doing, you know, very long boils and we are um, uh, approaching it from a standpoint in which we don't necessarily want to add a lot of, um, I, I guess I could say cheating sort of ways. So, so there's there certainly ways. Like using ways, dry malt right? extract instead of doing a double Yeah, dry malt or extract like or, um, you, you know, you can... Um, you can add maltodextrin to mimic body instead of using flaked barley and flaked weed and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's one of those things where I think that we can, we can totally nail uh, that old school approach to stouts. Um, so hopefully over the next few years, 
um, we're able to share more of that with people. I think yeah. the problem is that it's been very limited. And so, yeah. you know, it's been... It takes a while to, to wait. And it, right. takes, it takes a lot of space. I think that's the other thing people don't kind of quite understand about barrel aging is the amount of space you have to dedicate, especially at a smaller location in the, where you might have a high, high rent. You know, you might have a high rent and can't really afford to, to fill it all up with barrels. And so having offsite storage is great, but you also need to wait. You need to be patient. Totally. You need to let, let the beer develop into what it's going to be over mm -hmm. a long period of time. Well, let's, um, let's keep moving. We have a couple more beers we want to taste, I believe. Andrew, let's jump into the Turkish Coffee Stout. Yeah, so uh, Turkish Coffee Stout uh, has been one of the flagships uh, for Intrepid Sojourner Beer Project. And uh, it's one of my favorite beers. I, <laughs> one of the reasons I feel like we started with Stout Month is because we both love Stout. I do love <laughs> Stouts. Like, yeah. it's, so it's, I love a beer that you can just sit and, and sip on. So so some of these Russian Imperial, Russian Imperial Stouts are um, really nice. So um, again, so with Intrepid Sojourner, we really try a lot of times to mimic um, either a particular cuisine or, or in this case, right, a coffee beverage. Um, and like the goal is to create not just like a flavor experience for the consumer, but like create a kind of um, travel experience as well. Like right. my favorite thing, and it happens probably the most of all our beers with this beer. It's when, you know, people belly up to the bar and they order Turkish coffee stout and they're like, oh, you know, like this reminds me of 10 years ago when I was in Istanbul or I've always wanted to go to Istanbul or, you know, hey, have you been to Turkey? And it, it, it like starts this like reminiscing or planning. Yeah, yeah. And it's like... That's it, kind of part of the experience that we were just talking about, right? That's kind of part of the experience. Like, I feel like a successful um, flavor experience, whether it's, you know, beer or some other food product. Uh, I'm sure sh a lot of chefs would agree. Like, we want to create like that full sensory experience. Right instead of just like, oh, this tastes really nice. Yeah, and flavor memory is one of those really cool things where uh, everybody has this experience where you smell something that reminds you of uh, your grandmother's cooking. And right. It, and it brings you to a time in your past where you were with a bunch of family and everything was great. And, and it kind of can really transport you just having that very quick flavor experience. So I think, I think that's powerful especially when you're trying to um, kind of bring in other cultures, right? And kind of create an, uh, maybe an escapism in your, uh, part of it's escapism, part of it's uh, education. You learn about some other culture right. and you can kind of feel transported there at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And so that, that's, that's sort of the goal. So again, it's, it's based off of a beverage, Turkish coffee or Arabic coffee, uh, depending on sort of where you are geographically. Um, um, it starts, you know, we're talking stout styles, it kind of starts as a foreign export stout um, in terms of its, like, ABV. Um, but, you know, it deviates from there pretty quickly with mm -hmm. the cardamom and the hop profile. Yeah, um, yeah so. this is a lot more coffee forward. I mean, <clears throat> we had... We, we had one other beer with coffee, um, <clears throat> which I think at was more of a complementary flavor to the overall profile. Uh, maybe it was a little more spirit forward. Uh, and this, I, I get a lot more coffee right on the nose and kind of as a prominent flavor in the beer. Yeah, so we've actually been, we've actually been working on like sourcing our Turkish coffee. We get it from a company in Turkey, um, but Turkey's not required to provide like any information about the product. Maybe we so should talk like, about this later. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, where, you know, so... Uh, we, we've been working, uh, you know, with places like Copper Door uh, Coffee down the street from us to kind of figure out, you know, w what is it? But our best guess is it's a blend of Brazilian and Indian um, Robusta coffees. Mm -hmm. And then it probably has some green cardamom in it already. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and then we you add, add fresh we add, green cardamom. Yeah, um, usually like the decorticated uh, green cardamom. So it's outside of the pot. It's mm -hmm. broken down. Um, and... So we'll add that. And then the orange peel to kind of help with the, the sweetness and the astringency. It's kind of an earthy taste, too. I mean, yeah. It's got, yeah. That, it's got that deep, rich sort of, uh, almost like you can, you can taste the terroir almost, right? So, yeah. like, it's got that intensity to it. Yeah, and that's the thing we sort of run into, again, like using, a, like, a different type of coffee, it, talking a little bit about it earlier with like setting expectations is like you know well uh, people be like well where's the coffee I'm like well it's, it's full of coffee uh, but it's not that kind of like macadamia nut um, character that I feel like a lot of people sure. are used to in their yeah. in their coffee stouts or in their cup of coffee in the morning 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of, um, especially brewing a style of beer like this, is, is providing some reference point for the customer. And it's, it, uh, to be totally honest, it's, it's hard to do on a day-to-day -day basis when you're running essentially a bar. Uh, that's what most tap rooms are like. It's hard to do day-to-day. -day. But we do a lot of it at festivals where you have a beer with complex ingredients and you can bring those ingredients with you and you can let them smell the ingredients, you can let them taste the ingredients. And it's a total light bulb moment. I see it over and over and over again when I interact with people at festivals and at the bar is like, you can make the connection if you're handed a thing. If you just say, oh, it's with this and it's with that and it's with that. And it's, sometimes it's, it's just hard, especially if you don't have a reference point for that ingredient, which maybe is a little more exotic. Green cardamom, I use it a lot in, in brewing because it's in our chai milk stout. You use it a lot, but the everyday person, maybe they don't even have never seen green cardamom or other than kind of like a sawdust powder that you'd find at the grocery store, which really tastes nothing like actual <clears throat> green cardamom. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of kind of providing those reference points for people. And maybe even yeah. like, and Turkish coffee is, is sort of a more um, harsher or different preparation of coffee, right? Because you've always said that Turkish coffee is a style of coffee, but it's also a preparation method, right? Right. So any coffee can be labeled Turkish coffee, right? It's a, on, on one level, it's a grind, right? It's like a powdered sugar level of grind. Mm. So you have like sort of maximum surface area. Yeah, and then espresso it, almost. It, uh, yeah. It's like, it's like one or two steps beyond espresso roast. And mm. then it's usually, like I said, incorporated into the boiling process as opposed to right. uh, being dripped through or something separately. Um, I, I actually, uh, kind of just as a side note, I know, you know, uh, being in Denver at altitude, um, I'd be curious the flavor difference between boiling something at 212 and getting w what flavor compounds you extract from the coffee versus doing it at a lower temperature because of our elevation, whether how much of an impact that has on the flavor uh, compounds that you're extracting from the Turkish coffee. Yeah, I, I mean, I imagine it has a substantial difference. Um, we don't have a sea level location yet. No, uh, you should work on that. So I can't tell you. Um, but I mean... Uh, yeah. Well, As a side note, yeah. Yeah, it's a we'll great beer. Posted. Yeah, keep me posted on that one. Well, kind of to tie into this flavor profile, we brought our chai milk stout with us. Um, so... Um, uh, the base beer, you know, as, as the name implies, it's a milk stout. Um, so it's going to be, you know, pale malt, uh, a little bit of higher end crystal, oats for some body. We use lactose in the boil. Um, we have some chocolate malt and a little bit of roasted barley. Uh, and that's kind of what creates the base of the beer. And then the, the real flavor in this beer comes from um, the chai spices that we use. So if you want to grab those for me, we have... Sure. Um, yeah, I brought two different things with me, and this is, this is usually what I'll bring to events with me to kind of let people know what it is. So I brought two items. We kind of have the, um, the, the, the tea. So this is kind of chai tea. If you can get a peek at, uh, at that. It's a blend of all of our spices plus uh, black tea uh, from India. Um, and then uh, what we put in this tea is the spice blend. So the spice blend, if you can take a peek at that, is um, a mix of uh, cardamom, uh, ginger, cinnamon, black pepper, there's a couple other things I'm going to forget. Um, but it's got a very, just very lightly smell that, but it's got um, a very strong aroma of uh, cardamom and, um, and, uh, and those other spices that I mentioned. But when you smell that and then you drink the beer, you'll kind of be able to make the connection pretty quickly uh, between the two. No, it's a lot of fun. I um, I uh, we used to make a beer at Avery called um, Chai High. Yeah, I think it's since the been brown, discontinued. Brown ale? Yeah, and that was just a bhakti chai, con bhakti chai concentrate dosed into uh, just a brown ale base. But what's so crazy is uh, how well those those spice elements work with a malt profile. Mm. Um, and even in you know the um, the Turkish coffee stout, the cardamom really comes through and and complements a lot of those roasty, roasty notes that you get in, in, in both of them, um, both coffee and chocolate. And, you know, there's a lot going on in both of them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I like the, the I think it makes a, the, the, the style a lot more approachable for people too, because it kind of has that more fresh menthol -y, minty finish from the cardamom. Mm -hmm. It kind of cuts that roasty, uh, more acidic finish you might get with a stout. And even the, the heavier body, I think it helps. I mean, it's not physically changing the body in any way. The beer still has the same finishing gravity. It finishes 
you know, I guess probably around seven Play-Doh or so, but it, it has the appearance of a lighter body because it's kind of minty, because it's refreshing. So I think it helps it be a more drinkable beer, uh, maybe a perhaps more balanced beer too. Man, that's a lot of stouts. We um, really ran the gamut from some lower nice. ABV, dry Irish stouts with Guinness, some more sessionable ones, lots of adjuncts, barrel aging, high ABV, um, really big spectrum of stouts. And I think we just scratched the surface. The, the stout. stout is such a great style to, uh, <clears throat> to incorporate lots of ingredients into. And you know, on our show next week, we're gonna be <clears throat> talking a little bit heavier on adjuncts in yeah. stouts. So Novo Coffee will be in the house. Yep. Savory Spice Shop uh, will be in the house. And yeah, we're gonna take that deep dive into uh, some of those pastry stouts and some of those adjunct stouts and talk about flavor combinations and, and putting flavor profiles together. Um, and also just how do you, how do you use these? Yeah. strange ingredients. Right. How do you use them in beer? And where do they come from? What, what happens before you get them? Everyone knows what coffee looks like. Everyone's, most everyone's drank coffee. You know what the grounds look like. But what happens before it gets to you? It's a really fascinating process. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, people uh, involved in that process before it even gets to you. So I'm excited to meet with those guys. Um, Patrick, I want to thank you for, for being on the show. No problem. Yes, really you. great to chat with you and here. hear what uh, Cerebral's been up to and taste some of the great beers that you guys are making. So... Thanks, and I'm um, looking forward to, to ne next week's show. Yeah, so from Studio Kitchen Colorado, home of the Modern Eater, Eater Network, this has been Beercraft, Colorado's craft beer show. Join us next Wednesday, 2.30. Uh, 2.30 p.m. Live on Facebook. Catch it live.